Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the past few videos, we've been looking at properties of solutions, and today I want to tell you how we can use them to find out what a solution is made of, even if we don't know anything about the solute at first. In order to get there, we'll learn about one of the most important processes that happens in the cells of your body, and how a change in the concentration around your cells can make that process kill us. To begin, remember that solutions have four properties that depend on the concentration of the solute. These are called colligative properties, and they're vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. We talked about the first three in the previous two videos, so now it's time to talk about the last one, osmotic pressure. First, we need to know a little bit about osmosis. You may have learned about osmosis in a biology course already. The idea is this. Suppose you had a thin film of material, but instead of being a solid sheet, this thin film has thousands of tiny microscopic holes called pores in it. If these holes were large, all the molecules in the solution would pass back and forth through the pores. This would be true for both the solute molecules and the solvent molecules. But what if the holes were even smaller? In that case, the larger molecules wouldn't be able to get through the pores. Water molecules are especially small, so they'll usually be able to get through the pores, even when the pores are too small for the solute molecules. For example, if we have a solution of sodium chloride, or sucrose, dissolved in water, the sodium and chloride ions, or the sucrose molecules, would all be too large to fit through the pores but the water molecules could pass through the pores and could therefore move from one side of the film to the other. A film like this, which allows some compounds to pass through but not others, is called a semipermeable membrane. And semipermeable membranes are crucial for understanding cells. What do membranes like this have to do with cells? Well, it turns out that the surface of a cell is a semipermeable membrane. All the cells in your body contain a fluid that's mostly made of water, and the water has a variety of solutes dissolved in it. The solutes include different types of sugar, salt, proteins, minerals, vitamins, and lots of other compounds. There's also fluid outside the cells called the intercellular fluid, and this is mostly made of water and has many of the same molecules dissolved in it that are inside the cells. In most animal cells, the outside surface is called the cell membrane, and this is a semi-permeable membrane, just like the one we were looking at a minute ago. So, water can freely pass back and forth through the pores in the cell membrane, but most of the solutes can't. That way, the solutes that the cell needs in order to live, like sugars and proteins, will stay inside the cell. They won't be able to leave the cell unless the cell wants to excrete them. But semi-permeable membranes have one other feature that's especially interesting for us. Suppose we have a membrane, and there's a salt solution on both sides. But the solution on the left has a higher concentration than the one on the right. If there were no membrane separating them, the two solutions would just mix together, and the concentration would end up being the same throughout the whole solution. But because there's a membrane in the way, that can't happen the two solutions want to mix so that the concentration is the same on both sides. Since the solute concentration is higher on the left, some solute molecules would like to move to the other side, but remember, the pores are too small for the solute to get through. That means that, in order to get the concentration to be the same on both sides of the membrane, it's the water that will have to move instead of the solute. So, the water will move from the right side to the left. That will dilute the solute concentration on the left side and also raise the concentration on the right. Water molecules will keep flowing from the right side to the left until eventually the concentration is the same on both sides of the membrane. This process is called osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water, but not solute, across a semi-permeable membrane in order to equalize the concentration on both sides. It's a really important phenomenon for your cells, and here's why. Suppose we have an amoeba, or another one-celled creature, living in a pond. Like all cells, it contains a fluid made of water and dissolved solutes. 
Suddenly, some fertilizer gets washed into the pond. Many kinds of fertilizer have nitrate ions in them, so the concentration of nitrate in the pond will go up. But think about what that means for our amoeba. The nitrate concentration inside its cell will be much lower than the new concentration in the pond. The two concentrations will try to become equal. That could happen by increasing the amount of nitrate in the cell, but remember the cell membrane is semi-permeable. That means the solute, nitrate, can't cross it. Instead, water will flow out of the cell. It's as though the tiny amount of water in the cell is trying to come out and dilute all the solute in the pond. Losing that water will make the amoeba shrivel and will probably kill it. That's the same thing that happens if a slug touches salt. The slug has a semi-permeable membrane as a skin, so when there's a lot of salt on the outside, water comes out of the slug's cells in an attempt to dilute the salt. But there's way too much salt on the outside, so essentially all the water comes out of the slug cells, and that kills the slug. This can also happen to you if you drink salt water. If you do, then the fluid in your body outside the cells will become salty, and that will cause the water in your cells to come out in an attempt to reduce the concentration. So, if you drink salt water, you'll actually lose water from your cells, which will make your thirst worse. Now, imagine that one side of a semi-permeable membrane has only water on it, and the other side has both water and a solute. The water from the first side will move through the membrane, and when it does so, the water exerts pressure on the membrane. This pressure is called the osmotic pressure, and as you might guess, the pressure is stronger when the concentration on the right side of the membrane is larger. Since it depends on the concentration, that makes this a colligative property. Here's an equation for the osmotic pressure. Pi here is the symbol we use for osmotic pressure, and it's usually measured in atmospheres. This is not the number pi that you know about from geometry and mathematics. The rest of the variables are probably familiar to you from the previous videos. I is the Van't Hoff factor, which you learned about from the previous video. M is the molarity. R is the gas law constant, which you learned about in general chemistry 1. In case you've forgotten, it's equal to 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over Kelvin's moles. Finally, T is the temperature. Notice that because the units for R includes Kelvins, that's the unit we need to use for the temperature. If you use Celsius instead, the units won't work out, and you'll get an incorrect result in your calculation. Let's try an example. Suppose we have 100 milliliters of a solution containing 30 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in water. We put this on one side of a semi-permeable membrane and pure water on the other side, and the temperature is 25.0 degrees Celsius. What will be the osmotic pressure across the membrane? For this problem, we'll use the equation we just learned for osmotic pressure. The Van't Hoff factor tells us how many particles we'll get for every solute molecule. Since NaCl breaks up into two ions, the Van't Hoff factor is 2. For M, we need to calculate the molarity. We have 30.0 grams of sodium chloride. Using the periodic table, we find that this is 0.513 moles. We have 100 milliliters of solution which is 0 0.100 liters, and that gives us a molarity of 5.13 m. R is the gas law constant I mentioned earlier, and T is the temperature. Don't forget to convert it into kelvins. Solving the equation gives us an osmotic pressure of 251 atmospheres, a very high pressure. So now we've looked at all four of the different colligative properties. Now that we've done that, let's talk about another important application of colligative properties. It turns out that we can use them to help us figure out the identity of unknown chemicals. Here's how. 
Suppose we have 1.07 grams of an unknown molecular compound, and we dissolve it in 78.1 grams of camphor. When we do that, it makes the melting point of the camphor decrease from 179.5 degrees C to 176.0 degrees. Based on that, what's the molecular weight of our unknown? The first thing we need to do is decide which colligative property is being used here. The solvent is camphor, and the solute is the unknown. When we added the unknown, the melting point of the camphor went down. If you think about it, you'll probably realize that the melting point is the same thing as the freezing point. So the freezing point is what went down. That means the colligative property we're using is freezing point depression. Here's the equation for that, which we learned in the last video. In this example, we know the change in the freezing point, the Van Hoff factor, and Kf, which we can look up in a table. On a test or in the homework, this would be given to you. The one thing we don't know is the molality, so that's what we'll solve for. Delta Tf is the change in the freezing point, which is 3.5 degrees. What about the Van Hoff factor? We don't know what the solute is, but the question tells us it's a molecular compound. If you watched earlier videos, you know that this means our compound doesn't break up into ions, so the Van Hoff factor is 1. If we look up the value of Kf for camphor, we find out that it's 40 degrees C per molal. So we'll plug all these values into our equation and solve for m, the molality. That gives us a molality of 0 0.0875. But that's not our answer yet. The question asked us to figure out the molecular weight of the unknown. As you might remember, the molecular weight is measured in grams per mole. We already have the grams of our unknown. It's 1.07. So we just need to know the moles. That's where the molality we just calculated comes in. You might remember that molality is the moles of solute divided by the kilograms of solvent. We just calculated what the molality is, and we know the kilograms of solvent, so we can find out the moles. We found out that the molality is 0.0875m, and the problem tells us that we have 78.1 grams of the solvent, camphor. That's 0.0781 kilograms. When we solve for the moles, we get 0.00683 moles. So now we can finally get the molecular weight. We divide the mass of the unknown by the moles, and we get 157 grams per mole. So that's our molecular weight. It doesn't exactly tell us what the unknown is, but it does tell us what the weight is, and that helps us narrow it down quite a lot. We can use any of the colligative properties to help us find the molecular weight of an unknown. In this example, we use the freezing point depression, but we could also use any of the other three colligative properties if we're given the right information in the question. You'll get plenty of practice doing that in class and on the homework, and it's sure to be on your exams, too. Well, that's enough for today. When we talk again, we'll start a whole new topic We'll start taking a closer look at chemical equilibrium. It's the last major topic we'll be looking at in this course, and it ties together a lot of what we've learned in the last few chapters. I hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, have a good week.